Darlene Harris Vassar. And I've had the privilege to read my friend Chris Williams' book, The Little Girl Who Couldn't Read. Uh, it was a magnificent book. It was heartwarming. It was a book that I could relate to uh, back in the day because we were about the same age. So uh, all, her, all her descriptions of her home and her family resonates with me and mine. Uh, but the fact that she went to school and they, she felt like nobody wanted to teach her was heartbreaking. But what was heartwarming was the fact that she didn't give up. She chose to do her best, to do what she could do. And now to have written a book, I'm just in awe of that. And I believe if you read it, you will enjoy it. Thank you. I'm here at Christine's book signing. I, ha I come to purchase the book. I haven't read it yet, of course. But uh, I'm excited about it. So I'm really wait to read it. So this book means a lot to me because Christine's mother and my mother were best of friends. We all went to Cleveland Street Baptist Church in West Nashville and I remember a lot of the things that Christine went through during the time that she had placed in this book. All those chapters in the book mean a lot to me. I lived those chapters with her and her family. And so I'm just so thrilled and excited that I have had an opportunity to read the book. I'm getting ready to get it signed by Christine herself. I'm proud of her. But I'm even more proud of how she persevered and made a difference in the lives of African Americans in the city of Nashville, especially East Nashville. And that's my story. That's wonderful. That's so nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. My name is Robin Dunlap, and I just met Ms. And uh, it's so exciting to be Miss Williams. That's okay. It was okay. been a okay. couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> um, and I just met her as we came into the store. Um, I have read this book as well from front to back. And Christine and I are best friends. We started traveling together when our children were young. And um, we would go everywhere. And then my son played in the NFL, so we would travel and we'd been to the Super Bowl together and everything. So a lot of these stories that she wrote in this book, I have heard the stories from her. And when they, they came to life when I read this book and she put it all together and it gave, you know, I've heard bits and pieces, but when it flowed together, her life story, this is her true, complete life story and it is amazing. She is the smartest person I know. I tell her that all the time. I say, I don't care when you learn how to read when you are adult or whatever. You are one of the smartest people I know. So I'm just happy to be here, proud to be here, glad to meet some good friends and Christine's and um, I hope you come and I hope you go get this book and read it because it will make all the difference in the world to you and your family and anyone you might know that might be struggling through some things because they can persevere what Christine Hello, my name is Jordan Harris. I'm the owner of Arcade Line, which is a bookstore here on the historic Jefferson Street in North Nashville. And I'm excited and honored to have Ms. Christine Williams here for a book signing about her book, about a little girl who can't read. And uh, it's a very good topic to have and talk about here in this bookstore as literacy is a very important factor in the development and up uplifting of African Americans. Uh, we're, we're very excited to host her here for her book signing, and we welcome other local authors to, to come talk to us about having book signings here because uh, reading is fundamental. As our founder said, power now, reading is how, and that's something that we promote here. Thank you. Hey, my name is Vicky Lowe. I'm a friend of Christine Williams, and we have been friends for over 20 years. We met in 1948. I had kids who grew up together. We grew up together. We met down at Union Recreation Park when our kids were only about four, four years old. As a matter of fact, I used to babysit the children. <laughs> I was the babysitter. But uh, to get to know Christine Williams is a blessing. She is really what you can call a true friend to you. Um, and this book 
if this book about her lifestyle is something I have been telling her to get into ever since I heard of her story, which has been almost 35, 40 years ago. So anyway, uh, to make matters, to make matters, it's a good book. You gotta get it, read it, and it's a story of a lifetime. My name is Amber Carr. Um, I'm an associate at Alley Born Images. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Christine to organize the book signing today. Um, and I was here when she came and dropped off the books. Um, and I was inspired by her story. I was able to get a copy. Um, and I read a bit. Um, I was inspired by her poetic outlook on life. I felt like what was really special about it was how observant she is. I loved how she spoke about nature um, and her memories with her family, uh, the feelings that she had uh, when she was pregnant with her first son, um, and just in general the level of determination and um, introspection that she had um, moving through uh, Shoney's school system, um, working uh, or uh, being on the army base. Um, I just, I just really appreciated the sense of dignity that there's this, there are systems in place and situations in place meant to kind of take away that dignity from black people um, and obscure all of this beauty and life and all that there is to see. Um, and what I appreciated about Christine's book is the fact that um, she had that introspection all along. And I think that her writing that story down for all of us to experience is really powerful. Um, and I'm excited to be here and look forward to doing more work with Miss Williams in the future. My name is Kenetra Henderson Fitz, and um, I am here in support of Christine Williams and her new book. Um, I have known her for over two years, and her book is a testimony to her life and how she has overcome. Uh, for one person to have so many obstacles and to just keep um, striving, keep progressing, keep succeeding um, with just a wonderful attitude, um, who's just willing to help anybody that needs help in spite of and, be, and um, um, despite everything that she's been through. Um, I encourage everyone to get her book, read her book. Um, if you ever need to be inspired, um, that's what you need to read. Thank you. First of all, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so, born in 1960, Christine Williams has lived her life as a trailblazer. From being one of a few students to first integrate national schools to serving as one of 11 plaintiffs in a lawsuit that changed the restaurant industry, Christine has forged a life of honor through an innate awareness of her own worth. And thanks to her commitment to putting this story on paper, we get to experience firsthand sensitivity and poetic outlook that carried her through it all. So this is more than a story about integration and Shoney's, but it's a book about family, perseverance, and poetic gratitude. So we are super thrilled to hear her talk about it today. Um, and with no further ado, I would like to present the author of A Little Girl Who Can't Read, writes a book about, writes a book and brings the Shoney's Corporation to its knees, Christine Williams. Well, thanks everybody for coming, especially family and friends. Some of you I know been known for years, and then there's been a few people that I don't know I just met today. So I want to tell you a little bit about my book, A Little Girl Who Can't Read. It started years ago for me in kindergarten. I was in an all-black school, and the very next year is when Nashville, Tennessee decided to integrate schools. Well, that's when my education took a derail. I had a white teacher that literally refuses to teach the two little black girls to read. I remember, just like it was yesterday, when I walked it through that first grade class. 
the two teachers were standing at the doorway and one said to the other, they may send them here, but we don't have to teach them anything. So being six years old, what do you know? How do you feel hearing that? Because I really didn't know what they meant, but they did just that. I was promoted year after year. And then after a while, when you're in the third grade, fourth grade, now you're embarrassed because you're not all on the same playing field anymore. When you're a kindergartner or first grade, nobody really knows and nobody looks at each other like, well, she doesn't know this or he doesn't know that. But when you get older, then you start to understand how embarrassing that is and how you are ashamed and you try to hide. So I just want to say I hear people say all the time today, it takes a village to raise children. It takes a village. And it still does. But the village has changed. So we must do our part in helping these young kids learn before they ever leave first grade, second grade. Because after that, it begins to be too late. And the village has changed because I say, because I worked, I figured out a way to make money and to take care of myself. So I persevered through a lot. Today, it's not like that. And fast forward just a little bit, I went to work for a restaurant named Shoney's. And Shoney's was determined that they were not going to let African Americans work in their dining room. That was okay for me because I couldn't read anyway. So everything that I learned, I learned by hands-on. I watched, I remembered, I looked at the menus, I looked at the pictures, and I learned Shoney's like the back of my hand. I knew operations better than some of the big wheels that came in there bossing people around. So I spent many years in Shoney's, and then I decided that, well, I'm good at what I do. Um, I think I should work in the dining room. So I, I pressed and I pressed, and then eventually they kind of threw me out there when they were short-staffed it, and the big wheels wasn't coming in to see me out there. So I was able to get out there and work a little bit. So, but eventually I did work in the dining room. But I want to say the biggest thing to me was that I didn't think there was anything really wrong with that. And that was <coughs> sad to me because I didn't know how wrong that they were doing me and how wrong the Metro Schools did me. I had no idea. So it's a really good book. It's my story. I would love for everyone to read it. And I would love for everyone to try to get in contact with me in some sort of way. Let's make a difference. That's what I want to do. Thank you. So, if any of y'all have questions, you want to ask? I have a question. Where, where else can we get the book? I know that they're selling it here at Amazon. Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. It is also on ebook. And, um, oh, there's one other place. Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Oh, Apple. iTunes. Yeah. Apple. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about getting in touch with Metro Public Schools in regards to your book and your story? And I, I haven't. I haven't actually talked with them, but I know um, several people have talked with me that know school principals and teachers, and they're wanting me to come and speak with their students, and and I, I hope that that you know, materialize. I hope that I'm able to do that. You told me that you traveled a great deal uh, at one time to get to the place where your husband was with your child. Don't get too specific with it, but tell people about the challenge that presented for you. Well, um, I married young and had children. and. My husband 
was in the military and he uh, was in Fort Hood, Texas. So he packed us all up and we went to Fort Hood, Texas. Mind you, I was very young. I was only 16 years old. And so after being down there for a while, I had no idea what being married meant or being away from your mom and daddy. I had never lived outside of my mom and dad's house. So we headed to Texas. And so when we got there by him being in the military, I didn't know that they have to leave and go to duty and be gone a week or two weeks. And so I'm literally staying in this little apartment scared to death because it's nighttime outside and I'm used to my mom and dad being in the next room. So it's dark and I'm scared. So being there for a while, I decided, well, if he goes back to that doggone duty thing again, I'm going home, you know. Had no idea. So um, my dad sent me um, a ticket and it was an airline ticket. Never rode the plane before. So that didn't work because we were in Killeen, Texas. They didn't have a major airport and it was Liberty L plane. And I said, no, I'm not getting on that. So that went into a bus ticket by Greyhound. And I packed up everything for my son, bottles, food, and I knew it was going to be a 25 hour trip. I knew that. Headed on down the highway, I got really nervous and scared because I couldn't read the signs on the highway. And so that presented another challenge. So I befriended the bus driver and he set me and my baby behind him. And he said, don't you worry. He said, you're just a baby. I will get you to Nashville, Tennessee. So along the way, you have to change buses. So he would walk me and hand me off to the next bus driver and say, hey, she's going to need your assistance. Just be sure that she gets off at the right stops. What was your determination in learning how to be just focusing on people? My children. My children. There was a program here in Nashville called Law Off the Way of Reading. And um, I joined that program. It was designed to teach foreigners English. So, but little did they know that there were so many Americans that I could speak English well. Um, I still struggle today, but I couldn't read. So when I joined that program, it was built up of a bunch of churches that did volunteer work. And they took me in. Um, they were on Gallanton Road here in Nashville. And we would ride the city bus me and my children and it was the best thing ever because not only did they take me into a room to tutor me they tutored my two sons and so therefore I didn't have to worry as much about whether they are really learning what they're supposed to be learning because as parents we we send our children to school and we feel comfortable that they're going to get what they need at this particular time, my mother and father were excited because I was going to a white school because white is always better. And so, but little did they know what was really going on once I went into that school building. So, um, yeah, that was my biggest motivation. It really was. And, and just to be sure that they're going to learn to read, you know, because at this point, I wasn't thinking about graduating from high school. I just want you to be able to read. And, uh, and of course, my, my sons all graduated from high school. And it was just, that's, that's what really motivated me because I just wanted to change. I wanted for them not to be like me. And so proudly to say that um, my oldest grandson is now a graduate of college and he graduated a couple of years ago from Western Kentucky. So I am super and so proud of not just myself, but being able to change, to raise the bar. So now, you know, I still don't have a high school diploma. My children do. And now my grandson has a college diploma. Well, he would tell me, degree grandmama. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why I speak of Metro School because see now you can really be a mentor in the Metro School system because not just you but a lot of others 
that is unable to read can see the accomplishment and the, I mean, just how big you are now, yeah. writing books. Well, you know who who would have who would have stunk it, but um, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, and and I and I, I really do. And sometimes when I talk to people, you know, they don't really want to hear that. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody, but you know, people don't really want to hear that. It's just like racism. You know, it makes them uncomfortable. So they don't want to talk about it. They don't want don't want to hear it. But it's up to us to tell our stories to be sure that we're valued and we're heard. I tell my story because that's one of the reasons is very little that I know about my grandparents. My mother was very educated, she could read well, but I couldn't even tell you what school she went to. So as we get older and older and our elders leave die off, um, well who who knows? Who knows? This is my grandson Cole. I wrote this book for him. I want my book to do well, but if it doesn't if it doesn't do no more than leave the legacy that they can pick up and their children can pick up, that's who your grandmother was. Wow. I have a question, I don't want to call the floor, but if I was going to start to write a book, where would I start? I mean, now that you've done this, where, what's the, what's the very beginning point? Because you and I have talked about you writing this book for years. Yes. So. I want, to, I want you to tell everybody how you started. Well, it started for me um, just sitting down and making myself a timeline. Okay, 1960. Um, year, no, it wasn't. <laughs> 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 like, hey, hey, the, the year I was born. Uh, then actually going to school uh, in 65, 66. So I just kind of made myself a little timeline and I just put that down and then I just kept trying to think, 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 you know, what happened then, you know, what was those years like? And I started from there and, uh, and don't let me close without saying there is a lady, her name is uh, Linda Christine Hughes and uh, she's been a great friend of mine for many, many years. And she told me that, um, listen, you get the chapters down and we'll get it fixed to where you have a manuscript to turn into a publisher. And, and we did just that. And then uh, another lady, Miss Eloise, she was a proofer. She proofread. So I was like blessed, just doubly blessed. And the timeline helped me out a lot uh, to be able to tell my story. And and here it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. Thank everyone for coming. <laughs> 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 thank you for yes. writing your story and sharing. Well, thank you. You tell it very well. Well, yeah. it's because I know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I know it. And I guess. Um, I'm not embarrassed anymore, yeah. you know. Yeah. I have no reason to be embarrassed because this was not something that I chose to do to me. It was done to me. And uh, so, and may I struggle today, but just know that every morning God wakes us up, it is a blessing. So I have another day to get it right or to do this. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I was wondering what your message would be to young people dealing with similar things that you dealt with. I believe my message would be is to don't give up on yourself. You know, persevere. Don't give up on yourself. That's why I say when we talked about the village, you know, it takes a village. But the village has changed. For me, I could, I could go and, and, and get a job. My, my sister filled out an application for me. I never filled out a piece of paperwork. They was just that desperate and they hired me and I went on. But the world has changed so and our young people have so many other choices out there that are not good choices. You know, those, the things that go on today were not out there for me. I knew that I have to work you know, and I know that I'm not going to have a highly paying, educated job, but 
my mother and father taught me that hard work still pays off. So, and I worked hard, and restaurant work is hard. And I moved, and I moved through that restaurant with bells. I mean, it took a while, but when I left that restaurant, I was a corporate trainer over about 100 restaurants driving a corporate car. So, yes, don't give up on yourself. Don't, you know, and don't be ashamed to ask for help. And that's where we come in at. We got to make them feel okay. You know, don't go outside. I listened to my grandson's mother talk about the village. Don't go outside of your circle looking for help because that's not where it's at. You know, so yes, please don't give up, you know. And if you know of programs or something that I can be involved in, don't hesitate to call because I really feel that's what I want to do. We have a school principal here, Joy, and um, she's an elementary school principal, and we talk all the time about the young kids in school. And um, they, they, really need, they really need help. And not when they get to junior high school, when they get to high school. It's great, we want all our kids to be smart and, and, and academically a high level, great ACT test. But well, what about the third graders that can't read? What about the seventh graders that are reading on a second grade level? They're not going to make it. I don't care what we tell ourselves. Well, I just simply wanted to say um, I absolutely appreciate you. Um, you mentioned um, being a part of a village, and I want people to know that you don't have to have a ton of college degrees to be a meaningful part of somebody's village. And what you have done for me and mine is absolutely irreplaceable. So I want to say thank you, and I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was her nanny for her two children. And, uh, and when I got that job, I was scared to death because she had all this stuff laid out every day that she wanted Curtis and Amaya to do. And I'm like, some of this, I don't even know how to do it. So, and I'm thinking, I sure hope they don't ask me. You know, and every now and then, Curtis would say, Miss Chris. And I said, what is it, Curtis? And, uh, he said, well, what about this right here? I said, hold on, I go get my phone. King, I call my good friend King Dunlap, and I'll say, King, Curtis needs some help. Can I put you on speakerphone? Yes. What do you, what do you need? So you know, I, you know, I, I might not be can be that help, but I can certainly help get you help. <laughs> and I would say that I am so proud. Don't start yet. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm so proud of you doing this and you keeping it moving because you have to in this day and time. And I'm so proud of the fact that you were part of our village. And now our kids are learning to be a part of a village. And they're starting to, um, and when I go to parties and things, I'm so excited because they are in their own little village, keeping their own little clique. And those are the ones that keep you moving. Yes. You know, and there are so many things I when I when I started reading the book, I didn't realize you know, there's things you don't realize. You didn't I didn't realize you couldn't read in the beginning. But that is so many people's story. Uh, you know, as a black person or a black woman growing a kid growing up in school, that is so many people's story that they don't they don't, they don't give you the attention that you need as a young child. And you have, to, you have to learn in your villages what kind of helps you to fight your way and know what you should be doing and the way you should go forward. And, and even with, my, you know, with me going to school, it was the same way because I went to a white school and I didn't get the attention I needed. But I was blessed to have a mother that was a teacher that pushed 
forward, that pushed me forward yes. in order to learn stuff. Yes. And it was that and then me with the motivation of with the people around me to keep us moving. So I kept myself moving and to be a little black girl from the country, I was able to travel the world. And with you, I'm so proud that you show, you're doing that because you're teaching other kids, you're teaching the kids and I hope, like Miss Vicky said, that you end up going into the school systems and things like that, because that's going to kind of help some of the kids. You never know when one little thing might help somebody. Yes. One little word, one yes. little word of encouragement or whatever might help another person. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say I'm very proud that you've done this, and I want you to keep it moving. It's going to work, and we're going to just all keep you in our prayers, and we're just going to keep you moving forward. Well, I, I thank you and I thank everyone, and I just have one last thing to say. Um, in April, April the 4th, I lost my youngest son, and I wasn't going to talk about this until the very end because I wanted to get through what I had to say. He is here with me, I know, for at least two to three months. I just didn't want to do anything. I didn't care about the book. I just didn't care because how do you go on because mothers and fathers are not supposed to bury their children not at all so I didn't really know what to do but I thank God because he is still with me and he is still pushing me to persevere on so it's just another testimony that I can say I'm, perf I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving on, you know, because I know God holds my hand and I know he is with the Lord. Oh, yes. Oh, yes.